So today's session is, uh, I thought uh, we will deal with a, a particular part called as the questionnaire design. Um, whether it is a quantitative research or a qualitative research, whether it is an experimental research or a sociological research, right? Whatever be the type of research, even if it is in historical research, we see that there is a role of questionnaire as a tool uh, being a very, very important in basically any kind of study, not only research for that matter, whenever we undertake studies you know, in, in our uh, architectural pedagogy, uh, when we have courses such as uh, urban design studios, rural design studios, where we take our students to various uh, built environment settings, to various uh, scenarios where the student has to go and then interact with that situation and need to collect data. You know, they need to bring back data. So in any of these situations, even case studies for that matter, when we take them on uh, specific building typology case studies. So wherever we take them, we insist on a questionnaire uh, and we tell them that this is one way of collecting data. Now, the similar thing applies to research because uh, in research, we are essentially trying to get data, right? And we are trying to analyze that data for a particular objective with a particular hypothesis or aim in our mind. So, Data is a very important aspect of research and the very nature of data itself is critical for the outcome of research. And even more important is the manner in which we collect that data, right? So during your research methods courses, you would have uh, gone through various data collection uh, stages, types of data collection and uh, data analysis and all that. So we will not be going into that part, uh, rather. Rather, I thought we would uh, stick on to a very important, and often it is, uh, it is thought of as a very simple tool. But uh, during my own experience, I have realized that the questionnaire is a very, very powerful tool. It's a very powerful technique of collecting data. And there are, lots of variations, there are lots of aspects about a questionnaire which we are uh, not aware of. We think we know what, what a questionnaire is, but there are different types of questionnaires, there are different objectives, and based on each of it, we, know we, can, we can have appropriate questionnaires for the particular type of research. So the question is of designing appropriate questionnaires, that which is most appropriate for our particular type of research. So, Without any further delay, I will uh, share my screen and move on to the, today's discussion. Is my screen visible, participants? Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, okay, thank you. So, this is what we will be discussing today and uh, we will also have a short assignment at the end of it because uh, doing practicing is perfection uh, perfecting isn't it so we'll have a very small assignment in which you all can involve uh, your uh, research domains and topics and we can have a discussion so let's get started uh, Right. So when we say the first thing, now, what is a questionnaire, right? Now, essentially, a questionnaire is a research instrument, okay? Now, it's an instrument in which we have a set of questions, as the term suggests, we have a set of questions. And what is the intention of these questions is because we want to get answers. And these answers are going to be our data, right? So designing a questionnaire goes as early as, you know, 1838 when the uh, Statistical Society of London started using them as a valid scientific tool. Okay, so it's as old as that. And uh, 
during our the last three days of uh, program and discussions, we all know that there are various types of questions called the close-ended, the open-ended, the qualitative, the quantitative. We will be seeing all of this. Okay. So essentially, a questionnaire uh, is something that we have to keep in mind is in a tool. Okay. And we need to gather data. So that is the basic objective to collect information. And why we are doing this? There are lots of reasons why we're doing this. We'll just go uh, one by one. Now, a questionnaire can be a good questionnaire or a bad questionnaire. So essentially, let's consider it it's as a well-designed questionnaire. So when we say a well-designed questionnaire, now the first thing is we want to gather data. But we need to gather this data in less time. So which means your questionnaire should be holistic. It should have considered all the variables, the parameters, and all the data that you need to gather. So a lot of thinking should have gone behind the formation of a good questionnaire. So if you have a very well-designed questionnaire, first uh, advantage is your time is reduced, right? You do not waste time. Now, the second thing is, there is something called, if you remember uh, in our earlier, we have something called as how the researcher interferes with data, right? So the independency of data or the autonomy of data is something that is very important in our research. Now, this is what a good questionnaire can do. A good questionnaire can remove that bias researcher. And if we have designed or we have written a well-framed scientific question, then the researcher is not going to be there anywhere in the questionnaire, in the whole data collection process. He will only be getting the data, right? So a good questionnaire allows the bias of the researcher to not get indulged in the whole research process. And um, nowadays we are having various kinds of you know online digital uh, question question formats. So these are quick and these are effective and you can and the advantage of that is you can have a large you know uh, target base. So your sampling size can be very big. And but of course that depends on uh, research to research. If you need it you can do it. If not you don't need to do it. Okay. Now uh, the next important thing is you can, uh, you know, you can use this even in historical uh, uh, data where you have to get some data uh, which is not available, okay? And you need to pick it up from the experiences, okay, of the people. So that way also it is very important. So when we look at a questionnaire, there are lots of reasons why a very good, well-designed questionnaire will help you in your research process. So having said that, now we need to define what is a good questionnaire, or isn't it? So when we say a good questionnaire, now the first thing is validity. Now, a good questionnaire, as the screen shows, should be valid, it should be clear, and it should be reliable, okay? And very importantly, from the respondent's point of view, it must be interesting. In, you know, whatever the data you want to gather, it's important you but that doesn't mean that the person so you need to design it and present it in such a way that the respondent can become interested in giving your uh, survey in giving a survey to you or responding to your question so these are all very important aspects now when we say validity okay validity is you have to see to it that the questionnaire is basically asking only what it is supposed to ask. Okay, so if I'm making a questionnaire for a, a product, uh, product satisfaction survey, let's say, okay, now I need to see to it that the questionnaire sticks on to that particular product only and it, and it sticks on only to the satisfaction aspect. I should not go out of the target of the particular uh, questionnaire's uh, purpose. Then it becomes very large and the respondent gets confused. That's important. So for example, uh, if in a rural uh, design studio, we are taking our uh, students to a rural setting 
and we are conducting a household survey, then the household survey must essentially stick on to the household survey only. Now, in the household survey question, if you ask questions regarding you know, construction techniques or the material, the vernacular material, then they get confused. Okay, they, they will keep switching on. So a respondent should be kept in a particular track of question. That is very important. The questioning track must be maintained. And that essentially depends on how you write the questions and how you sequence the questions, right? So that is very important. And from our point of view, uh, from the researcher's point of view, the questionnaire has to be reliable. That means I should have, you know, it's like how we say in scientific experiments, no matter how many times you do a particular set, uh, a particular experiment, given the same set of conditions and the same methodology, it should yield the same answer. So a similar question of reliability applies here also. So that is why when we say reliable, we you need to, and this is something that you need to check with the respondent. So for this, what we do is we have uh, cross questions. You know, we have cross questions in which the same question will be put up in a different pattern to see whether the respondent is giving the correct, the, the exact answer, the same answer, or whether the respondent is aware. Okay. So reliability is a very important factor of questionnaire. And which is why, you know, when we test a questionnaire, quest, when we design a questionnaire, if there are 20 questions, there will be about, uh, you know, first five questions. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. So somewhere in the 15th question, we will very, very subtly, okay, and very manipulatively be asking the fifth question again, but in a different format that the respondent doesn't know. And that is for you to check whether the respondent is giving the same answer as he did for the fifth question. So these kind of loopings within a questionnaire are permissible, are allowed, but you must be aware of it. The, the person who designs the questionnaire needs to be aware of it. If not, you can lose track of it, right? So reliability is a very important factor. And uh, as already told you, interest okay one should be uh, the question should be precise clear so that the when you when the respondent is reading it he should know okay this is what you're asking if you have very complex framing of questions you know with complex english sentences mixed english is not our mother tongue so you should uh, and of course we we are allowed to take questionnaires and data collection in whichever regional setting that is required that is possible but then in the translation the data should not be lost. So that's another thing we have to uh, think. So when we talk of interest, another important thing that we talk is, how are you presenting it to the respondent so the respondent finds it interesting, okay? So there are various techniques and there are various aspects in which we can do this. All this is available, okay? So these are the characteristics of when we say a good questionnaire, okay? So now we uh, we know what is a questionnaire. Uh, we know what can be the advantages of a good questionnaire. And we have seen what should be the characteristics of a good questionnaire. So if that is so, then how do we design a good questionnaire? Okay. So uh, what do you think should be the first step? And let's ask from the participants. Now, let me say that I, I'm designing a questionnaire for my research. Uh, my research, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, I, I need to... Uh, design about let me say 20 questions so what is the first thing in, in any questionnaire what do you think is the first thing that we need to consider any guesses Parsman, just switch on your mics and answer name place of living and okay uh, right so let's not uh, now that is you've gone into the details Okay, you've gone into the details of the question, the name, the place of living. Now, let me say I'm doing a product satisfaction. Okay, and I'm doing a global product. And I'm not bothered from where it is coming. So I really don't need a name and place. Mom, age group? Pardon me? Mom, age group? Okay. Now, if I'm uh, talking about uh, a, a particular 
data in which the age is not required uh, what how are they aware, were they aware of the product how okay right so they were I, aware of the product or had they used the product or if so through whom or how all right okay and so in been using them okay okay i'm looking for a larger aspect uh, you have all started going into the details ma'am an understanding of what the project is first yourself and then only you can design uh, questions related to the product maybe exactly uh, let's switch the term product okay but that's the exact uh, uh, reason so the first thing that you have to understand when you start designing questionnaire even before you start designing questionnaire is what is the information that you want okay now this seems very easy let me tell you this seems very simple so the minute i put this slide you would have thought ma'am what is this this we know no no you don't know trust me okay so whenever we start doing a questionnaire the first thing that we have to understand is every questionnaire should have an intention this this is the information that i have to collect the questionnaire intention is this is the information that has to be collected through this questionnaire now are the designers aware of that only when the designers are aware of that consciously will your questions be appropriate if not your questions will not be appropriate so this is the first thing that should be noted even before you start writing the question okay all of you please do this now let me ask you a very simple example i keep telling about the rural household survey isn't it so when we go we do questionnaires for household survey i'm sure all faculty know what is a household survey now tell me why do we do a household survey what is the purpose of doing a household survey only if we know the intention of a household survey will we know that you know we have to ask these set of questions isn't it so you must be very clear about the intention of why you are going to do this question why you are going to go and ask these set of questions what is the objective of this questionnaire so which is what i have put it as the conceptual framework okay the goals or the objectives now for example uh, let me tell you i am uh, doing a research on healthcare systems okay or let me do i am i am doing a research on hospitals and i am uh, trying to understand the design of wards okay let us call it as the design of hospital wards now i want to go to a, uh, to all the uh, government hospitals okay in my sample area and i want to collect data so now what is my intention my intention is i want to make the design of wards hospital wards better the uh, my uh, my intention my contention is that the design of general wards in hospitals is not good is not perfect and i am saying that i am going to go and check for this so what do you think should be the intention of the questionnaire what should be the conceptual framework what are all the things i should know before i go and before i even start writing the questions can we have some guesses yeah like for example how many beds are there in a particular ward because that would give you an idea about the privacy level okay then uh, access from the nurses station and things like that uh, how easy is it very first access. we should uh, study about the standards man exactly then we should compare with uh, what are existing exactly that is right so that's the right intention so you see if you were aware of what i was talking i told you a public hospital so when we say a public hospital your first intention is see this is where we do a lot of skippings in research because we think we know the first thing you should do is when i said it's a public hospital you should have asked me ma'am what is the class of hospital is it a district hospital is it a phc is it a capital city hospital right so one is the first thing is you should know the status the classification of the hospital and on that basis you should have known the standards and the codes by which the hospital is supposed to be run okay it is every public hospital has norms you know we have is codes we have 
the Indian uh, Health System Codes. So all these codes, they determine because that is the first step of designing that hospital. Whoever designed that hospital should have done that, right? And only on that basis, the very design would have been approved. So if that is the case, then I should first know the codes and the standards. And only if I have known the codes and the standards, my questions will cross check whether whatever, like you said, check whether how many beds are there, how many nurse station is there, how is the nurse station? I do not just go and see, you know, right, where is the nurse station? How many beds? No. If this is a, uh, let me say, a district level hospital, a general ward is supposed to have not more than 10 beds. Now, if, I, if that is a standard, then I will go and see, okay, this is a general male ward. How many beds are now existing as opposed to the standard? So you must understand that the intention of every questionnaire changes depending on the nature of the project. And accordingly, your question should be well informed in the first place. So I will now check whether the capacity of the ward, okay, the bed capacity of the ward, if it is yes, how many number of beds? It is no, how many number of beds? Then when I come back, okay, I will, I can do whatever I want. But the first thing is I should have counted the number of beds and I should have put that. Now, this intention, okay, which is, which comes from the standard. Now, for example, if the standard says the distance between a bed to another bed in a ward is to be minimum 1.2 meter, okay? Now, I should know that, okay? And I should have measured that in the place, in the, uh, when I go for my case study. Now, these are critical things. If I didn't know the standard, and if I just went for the on-site uh, survey, I just measure the number of beds and came. And I didn't you know, check for the in-between in uh, uh, distance between the beds. Now I will come back to my place and when I start looking at the data, I will see that something is missing. So then I have to go back once again, right? Similarly, how many for how many beds do you need to have one nurse station? So these kind of things, so first, uh, this is what we call as the conceptual framework. Designing, you, you must understand that a questionnaire is essentially designed to collect data. But to write a well-informed questionnaire, you must have enough information first. You should have sufficient data first, which we call as the, uh, you know, the conceptual framework. So you need to inform yourself about that particular uh, data and then write the questionnaire and then go on. Now, there are two things in this. One is informing yourself, okay, using standards, using manuals, using uh, published data. So this is one way of information. Now, there is a second thing in which we always call as a researcher's bias. Sometimes, you know, we would have studied in a particular school and we will be thinking in a particular way. So that is not good for research. Sometimes you need to break out that pattern of thinking. So, which is why whenever we do the conceptual framework of the questionnaire, we do two processes. You know, there are two ways of doing this. Now, this is what is called as a mind map. So, even before you start doing a questionnaire, okay, take a blank paper and write down at the central, at the center. If we all know what's a mind map, we teach our students, isn't it, in our design studios in our uh, uh, theory studios and all. So a mind map is basically a technique which captures all the thinking that happens in our mind. Now, why we do this mind map is, you take a, a empty paper, whatever is your central theme of that questionnaire. So as I told you, let's, let's keep the same theme, okay, the public hospital. So the design, uh, the effective design of a general ward. Let us keep this as the as exercise for today's discussion. So let me put in that, in the central theme is a general word. So then you start pulling out, like in a, in a real mind map, what happens? You start collecting or identifying all the components, all the aspects that are related to a general word, okay? In terms of planning, in terms of human resources, in terms of furnitures, in terms of medical services, medical facilities, infrastructure, right? In terms of patient care, in terms of patient requirements, in terms of attendant requirements, okay? Because the general ward, generally they have attendance. 
So attenders, if I the, all these, put them and bring out each aspect of study. Now, this is what a mind map is. As you can see, you put the central theme, you put all the influencing themes and keep breaking it up to, into its minutest detail. Okay. Now take this mind map, stick it in your wall or stick it in somewhere that you see every day before you draw, you know, before you start writing the questionnaire. Because I'll tell you what happens. When we start writing a questionnaire, our mind is always hierarchical. You know, our mind, whether we like it or not, somewhere or the other, our mind's thinking pattern is hierarchical. When it starts writing the question, it will go one, two, three in a hierarchical manner or it will go in a sequential manner. Now, when it goes sequentially, there is a possibility that, possibility that it skips some particular important thing. Now, for example, when if, if I just write a questionnaire without doing a mind map, now I may not be, you know, I, I may skip an, an, an entire data called as the attendant, the attender, right? The person who is taking care of the patient. And in all public hospitals, this is, uh, this is a common scenario, although there is no standard provision for this. But this is a common scenario because we lack the human resource. Already the uh, human resource staffs are very short, you know, they're, they're very uh, less number of staff. So attenders are one of the primary aspects. And this is one of the reasons why you will see, although the public hospitals wards are designed as per standards, anytime you go and see, it will seem crowded because the attenders spatial requirement has never been considered in the design or in the standardization of the ward. So something that is as critical as this, which can have a very massive outcome in my research at the end, will not figure in the beginning. It will not come in the uh, data collection in the questionnaire stages. But if you do a mind map before starting a questionnaire, then because in a, in a mind map, your mind is considering all the aspects and there is no hierarchy in this. So you are just randomly pulling up all the details, right? So this is a, a, a mind, I don't know how many of you have used mind map as a tool in, I don't know if you people use it in your design studios, but um, we do a lot, you know, I, I do this in my design studios also. And it's very helpful even for the children, you know, for the students, because whenever we get into design, it is easy based on each one's uh, bias to forget, you know, uh, uh, to skip uh, certain data or to skip certain information. And that is very common, right? So uh, I will suggest that uh, everyone does a mind map and have that as a, as a guiding tool before you actually start a questionnaire. Does anybody want to share any um, interesting information about mind map? Have you people tried it in your uh, pedagogy anytime? Uh, yes, ma'am. We yes, try it for uh, children's museum, actually, mind mapping exercise for conceptual development and all. Because uh, at times so happen right. the students doesn't understand how to start concept. So during that time, we were actually told them to have a mind mapping exercise and bring out whatever the children likes, dislikes, and whatever uh, that comes into picture when they think of children. And then uh, they started doing it. All right. Yeah. So did you find that it was useful? Yeah, did it they... was It was very useful, actually. Last time we had an online session uh, with the students and okay. uh, there was no, like, uh, it was one-to-one uh, -one sessions were not there because of online. So uh, the students' interactions were getting reduced and we are unable to actually tell them how to bring out the concept when it is a children's museum. So suddenly we got an idea that uh, why don't we do mind mapping exercise? And uh, after this, uh, uh, the students got benefited a lot actually, because once yeah. we introduced, they started understanding and then they started pulling out concepts and all. And from there, actually the design uh, went on really well. So it was a very yeah. good uh, experience also for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Any other experiences? Ma'am, I have tried uh, mind mapping in my urban design studios. And I think when the level increases from architecture to, let's say, urban areas or larger areas, I think mind mapping becomes a very useful tool because there are just so many parameters which need to be considered. 
and uh, how how well you understand and remember you are bound to forget something and especially when they go out for surveys when in, when they go out for interview uh, that's when i tell them just write it all down on a paper everything that you think is important is is what you would want to know about that area just write it down so i think yeah uh, it has been a good experience so right. far right Right. Nice. Nice to hear this. Anybody else? Any other? Uh... Madam, actually. Yes, ma'am. We tried it. Uh, I don't uh, mark that as a mind mapping, but we did in a reverse way, the same way where okay. from the team work. We started. Uh, we asked the students to okay. identify who all visit the project, whatever the project. It could be urban design or in hospital and all. We asked them to. see the perspective from the user you know from the collaborations right. from there we started uh, dealing with all the branches and uh, they did actually the project what we did is that uh, it's a pre pandemic multi transitional hub it was online completely okay. if i could get okay. chance i would have shared the, the students work they did very nice it is a completely online okay. mode they could uh, take very nicely when they when we introduced by the perspective of uh, collaboration i means we took we started with one branch and we spread that to as a mind mapping for our entire project thank you right thank you mm, i just wanted to say something yes ma'am yeah. so this mind mapping was uh, taught to us when i am talking about my uh, student life so this was introduced to us okay. during housing so the subject of housing was not introduced to us at all the faculty just asked the basic question as in uh, what would you look at when you want to buy a house or a flat so then everyone started giving out uh, adjectives like we would look at the cost we would look at the ventilation lighting room sizes etc so all these adjectives were noted down on the blackboard and by the end of the session we had around 50 to 60 adjectives and then these adjectives were grouped out and the ones which were not important were deleted and then these groups of the adjectives formed the mind map and then we were told that these are your basic requirements and now these should come in your own design so that happened in okay. housing and then there was another very creative experience in the basic design studio also when we were actually told to describe the route from our house to the college and by mm. the end of the session everyone realized that when you describe the route from your house to your college you tend to miss out observing things because you are in a hurry to reach college on time and whereas when you describe the route from college to yeah. home you tend to t- uh, tell every single detail that you observe so that was happening There happening more details right yeah uh, okay. yes please continue yeah Uh, same thing as for basic design. Right, right now we are dealing with basic design for first year students. Exactly same thing that uh, the earlier the participant has uh, mentioned. We are doing the same thing. Uh, we are asking the students so that there will be uh, a creative transformation from you uh, know uh, how to uh, understand design uh, as an architect. How to that that will help you from transferring from a uh, uh, as a student into an architectural uh, perspective. So we have asked them to uh, map their route from their home, whatever they see, whatever they have seen, what how do you remember? So they can understand what exactly uh, uh, a space, uh, visual perspective, and all. So the vistas, they they'll start understanding right from the starting. So that kind of success we have given right now, and these uh, students are enjoying a lot. We have to see the outcome right now. <laughs> yeah uh, as faculty we should uh, all uh, thank you so much all for sharing your experiences as faculty we should all understand that uh, you know uh, only when we involve the students in in answering their own questions you know the teaching learning uh, tail goes on to the next level so that's a very important aspect and uh, uh, let me tell you something about because i teach uh, the creative uh, design uh, course in my university uh, uh, sometimes for the architecture students and i also teach for uh, it's an open elective course we also teach it for uh, the engineering streams so 
you know, the mind mapping, uh, and we talk about mind mapping and the other creative techniques. Uh, we think the mind map is a very, uh, sometimes we think it's a kiddish tool. Trust me, it's one of the most evolved tools. And uh, the mind map is one of the first steps that some of the leading R&D laboratories worldwide, some of the multinational corporations, the R&D laboratories that they have, any innovative project starts with a mind map. And in fact, starts with a brainstorming session, which I'll talk about next, okay? So a mind map is actually a wonderful tool that actually documents, data documents, the complexity of the mind's processes when we are trying to solve a particular aspect. Now, in, in our olden days, in, uh, you know, in old school technique, uh, when we were all uh, students, we didn't have the concept of mind map, but our faculty used to tell us checklist. You know, we used to have what we called as a checklist and we would write down. So if we're going to do a questionnaire survey for household, uh, survey for rural, then we sit down and write down checklist one, two, three, four, five, like this. The problem of a checklist is the sequencing or this hierarchically, uh, you know, organizing. So uh, the mind map is one step ahead of the checklist in that it uh, breaks down that uh, sequencing and it gives you an absolutely new start, uh, an absolutely fresh start. So that is why a mind map is very important. And uh, just like uh, what, you know, uh, one of our participants just shared about what happened in their housing studio. Now that is essentially called as a brainstorming because uh, in a mind map, you sit separately as an individual and you data document your mind's process. In a brainstorming, we usually do it with everybody. We do it with, with, with a team. So you know, if, if I were to go back to the same exercise that we're talking, the general ward, the general hospital ward. So now if I wanted to find out what are all the criterias, you know, the design criteria uh, which will influence, now, let me say that I'm a person who's not been much to hospitals. So what I will do, I will gather a team, right? I will gather a team of my friends, or I, I, will, I will even have a separate brain, brainstorming session with doctors. I'll have a separate brainstorming session with nurses. I will have a separate brainstorming session with attenders, okay? And I will have a separate brainstorming session with people who have often been in hospital wards, like, you know, patients. So I'll gather them and then I'll ask them to, you know, tell, okay, tell me what is all, what are all the considerations? Now, what happens in a brainstorming is, a brainstorming is one of, one, one, once again, one of the most innovative techniques for you to understand new perspectives, perspectives that you have not thought about at all. So when we hear it from the people who have been there and, you know, when we hear different perspectives, then there are certain triggers that are in our mind that, you know, we'll get a new way of seeing it. So, you know, in, in, for innovative thinking and uh, the most successful research is based on innovative thinking. So if you actually want to start a good research, you know, you should start with brainstorming. And uh, you can you can organize these teams. Uh, don't, don't think that, uh, you know, uh, people will feel shy or people won't participate. It, it, there, there's nothing like that. It only depends on how you organize the team, right? You bring people together and you open up their context and ask them to react. Now, in any brainstorming, what we should understand first is we should just collect the ideas. The quantity is important. So you just collect the ideas and you put them all together, okay? And then you start looking at uh, the various possibilities, whether it has any influence on your research. So brainstorming is a wonderful technique if you can coordinate it. Every researcher should do this. You know, uh, because whenever we start with research, we have our own way of seeing it. Now, before you go too much into research, break that. Call people. Call people in your circle, your colleagues, your peer group. Conduct a brainstorming session and you will get fresh perspectives of seeing it. You know, in, in IIT, uh, we call our uh, canteens, our chai sessions are our brainstorming sessions. And uh, when I was doing my PhD at IIT, we have this ritual. At exactly 11 o'clock, all of us will break up for tea. <laughs> because we've been sitting in the lab uh, from morning. So, and all researchers, we'll all gather together uh, for tea. So when we, when we gather together for tea, we'll talk over the, you know, Chai pe charcha. So we'll talk over uh, chai, you know, 
what is happening in your reserve, what's happening in your reserve, what is happening. And we will let out all our depressions and all our anger, everything there, you know, this is not moving forward, this is not going. So somebody will tell you, why not you try this? Why not you try this? And, uh, you know, in fact, when I, when I was talking on the first day about my session, I had actually started with Christopher Alexander and I was looking at pattern language. And it was during one of the uh, tea sessions that, you know, I was very frustrated and I was like uh, complaining. And that's when one of my, you know, uh, colleagues, friends said, Lakshmi, why are you looking at this? Why don't you, you know, see Hilia's technique? And so I went back and I saw Hilia and that was an absolutely new starting to my research. So I keep telling this in whichever program I am in. My actual research was triggered in a tea canteen, in a tea shop. So you never know where ideas come from. They can come from anywhere. And you, you just need to be open. And any one single trigger, you know, can change the entire way you research. So brainstorming is a very, very important technique. And I will suggest all researchers here, I mean, if it had been in campus, if this program had been in campus, we would have conducted brainstorming sessions in the, you know, in the workshops. It would have been very interesting. But uh, do it in your own places and uh, do it with groups. And then you collect information and then uh, see which information is not needed, remove those. And there might be some good information, good data, which can direct your entire questionnaire, okay? So now, now mind mapping and brainstorming can be done for anything, literally any uh, creative process. Here we are looking at for the questionnaire, okay? So the next important aspect, okay? So the first important aspect of a questionnaire is, we said the intention, the objective, the conceptual framework, the goal of the questionnaire. Now, all this can vary if you do not think about the target respondent. From whom are you going to collect the data? Who is your target? Who is your sampling size? Which is your sampling population? Now that determines what your questionnaire should be. See, for example, the same uh, hospital general ward. If I'm going to do this questionnaire, okay, to doctors as one set of respondents, if I'm going to do this questionnaire to let me say uh, ward boys and the uh, the people who clean, okay, the the uh, supporting faculty, uh, the supporting staff who are in charge of maintenance and cleanliness, okay. So if we say like that, now will will I have the same set of questions for both the respondent group? Can I have the same set of questions? No, but we can Obviously make. Obviously not. We can make, madam. Still, by the satisfaction <laughs> methods and percentage of, uh, we can take, madam. Still. Okay. Now this is where your research comes into picture. This is where your creativity comes. Okay. So in your research methodology, if you think, now that depends on the questions and that also depends on your, how you're going to do it. Okay. So if you think that I need to have a separate set of questionnaire for, you know, here we are talking because the very specialized aspect. Okay. If not, you say that, no, I will have only the same set of questionnaire because uh, whoever it is, at the end of it, I'm looking only at the ward design. Now the ward is utilized by all of them together. So why should they have different questions? Okay. Now another person can say, I can defend against it also. i will say, no, the way that a person, uh, the amount of time that each person spends in a ward is different. So it is a patient who spends a maximum time. And next is the caregiver. Next are the, uh, you know, the technical, the professional people. And the maintenance and the service people hardly come in. They, they are not associated with the ward. So why should I take? So like this, everything depends on the creativity of your research methodology. You can keep defining your target, your sample size, and you must have a valid reason of doing it. Okay, that clarity should be there. So first thing is you must be very clear with your target respondent. But the reason why we're talking about target respondent is if you have a common questionnaire for everybody, from the cleaner uh, to the nurse, to the doctor, to the patient, to the attender, then your questionnaire should be holistic. Now, if you're going to have separate questionnaires for the separate uh, groups, then it can have separate uh, technicalities. So this is very important. Even before you start writing your question, 
the first thing you should be very clear is the intention. And the second thing you should be very clear is the target respondent. Who is going to answer the question? Because if they are educated people, what is the kind of uh, you know, question you can ask to them? If they are not educated, what is the kind of question you can ask to them? If they are a, a target which is closely associated with the area, what is the question I can ask to them? If they are a, 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 if they are a group that is not closely associated, they spend very less time, they are infrequent visitors, then what kind of question I should ask to them? So like this, you know, there is no template. There is no one standard practice uh, how, as to how a questionnaire should be set. And also there is no one standard practice as to what should be the target group. You can have different groups, you can have different questionnaires, and you can have same group or same questionnaire. Okay. Now, this is something which you must defend in your methodology, in your research methodology. This, why we're talking about this is because this target group is going to determine how your questions are going to be framed, the language, the words, everything is, is to be based on the target group. Because if the target group doesn't, you know, associate with your question, they're not going to respond. They will just lose interest. Remember the interest carry, they lose interest and they'll go if it's too technical. Then you have to know how should I ask the question to them. So the wordings of the questions will essentially be determined by the target group. So whenever we talk of uh, questionnaire design, you should understand that even before you actually start writing the question, all these have to be considered. And even before you start writing the question, you should know what are all the various stages that are involved in a survey. And what is it that you will be, you know, at, at the end of it, what is it that you want to do with this data? You should, have, you should have some particular idea, okay? Even if you don't know the exact analytical tool or something, you should know why you're collecting this data. You're not just going to do a questionnaire on words. You're going to collect this questionnaire because you want to assess whether the design of words is, is uh, conducive for effective performance, right? So that is the intention. So like this, when you go for a questionnaire design, you should know the following basic you know, stages that are involved with a survey. So you should know that uh, you, should, you should be very clear with the, uh, one of the participants' mic is on. Participant, please my, mute your mic. Uh, Ms. Regina, your mic is on. Right. So you have to understand that any questionnaire design is influenced and can be affected by the following uh, knowledge. So you should know the objective. You should know the key concept. You should know that there is something that this questionnaire is going to do to the hypothesis. So some way or the other, you should have you should have a general hypothesis around which this questionnaire is related to or around which this questionnaire revolves. And you should definitely know what is the mode of survey I'm going to use, right? Because if you don't know the mode of survey, you, your question can be wrongly worded. If it is to be over phone, you have to have a way of wording it. If it is uh, you know, an internet poll, then there should be a way of wording it. If it is a face-to-face -face collection of data, it's a different thing. If it is by mail, the question format will change. So that you should be very clear about the survey mode. And of course, as I told you, the target group is sampling. And what is this data at the end of it? Like what I'm going to do with this data, okay? So you should have some idea about the conclusion. You will not be very clear. You may not know fully, but a little bit, that is important. Now, you should all understand that the reason why do we do a questionnaire is we want to reduce whatever is the error that can be committed in data collection. We want to reduce that amount of error. The degree of error is to be reduced. That is the objective of a questionnaire. If we didn't go without a questionnaire, we will be committing more errors. So when we have a questionnaire, a questionnaire guides our, uh, our process of data collection. So that is the single goal of a questionnaire design. So therefore, please don't take questionnaires lightly. I keep telling my research students, that they'll say, ma'am, I'll go for survey. I said, you're going for survey is all right, but please understand that 
you have to put in a lot of work before you go for survey. Survey is not going for picnic. No, <laughs> sometimes they come with all the say, oh, ma'am, tomorrow I'll go for survey. Okay, right, but what have you done before you're going for the survey? You know, you're not going on a picnic uh, to go to the sample size and uh, collect things. So there should be a very, uh, uh, there should, uh, you know, I say in a survey, 50% of the work is to be done before the survey, not after. If you have done 50% of the thinking and clarity and work, before the survey, trust me, the other 50% will just naturally fall in place. If not, if you go on site and then when you're doing the survey, if you start doing the 100% or 90% work, you will see to it, you will see that your survey is extending and extending and extending. You will do one survey, second survey, third survey. So like that, uh, some amount of pre-work before you we all land up on site or case study or the sample, it's, it's better to have done all this. So which is why this, I, I, I thought I will do this particular uh, discussion for today's uh, session. Okay, so I guess we are all very clear with what a questionnaire is and why we need to do it. Now, let me very quickly go through what are the types of questionnaires, okay? Now, uh, there is a lot of data available on this. Uh, currently, your research methods courses will also be teaching you so I'll not go very much into detail, but let me, uh, you know, introduce it for everybody. People who have not gone or have not registered for PhD, for their benefit also, I just introduce all these so that when you start, you will know that you must have, you should, uh, you know, collect information on these. So, uh, so when we say types of business, basically, uh, as in day two, we were looking at it. There are basically uh, what we call as structured questionnaires or unstructured questionnaires, okay? And usually unstructured questionnaires are only used where we have qualitative data to be obtained. And generally, as much as possible, we keep qualitative data. Uh, we do not collect qualitative data from samples. Only if it is highly required, okay, then we use it. Because sometimes uh, the opinions of the sample might be very important, okay? If you're doing um, uh, psychosocial research, okay, if you're doing cultural research. So in these cases, the opinions of the sample can be important and it's very difficult uh, getting that as quantitative data. So there alone, we do qualitative uh, data collection using unstructured questionnaires. But please be very careful that unstructured questionnaire is a very difficult thing. It requires a lot of time once you finish the questionnaire and come back, you know, deriving, analyzing that data and deriving outputs and inferences from the data takes a long time, okay? So you have to be uh, very uh, stringent in, the, in how much of uh, unstructured questionnaire we use. And usually we use structured questionnaires and structured questionnaires are usually used for quantitative data, collective quantitative data. Right. Now we can also call them as close-ended and open-ended questions, okay? Open-ended questions are questions that we uh, ask to the, to the respondent and we just keep recording. We do not uh, in any way give any prompts or anything, okay? And then we later go back and we have to decode from it. Now, close-ended questions are where we give the question and we also give them the options to respond. So there is a limited response that is required from the respondent. The respondent cannot give his or her own options. So this is that is why it's called close-ended, which means the options are part a part of the design of the question. They are inherent in the questions. Okay, so these are called close-ended questions. So if you can see in the slide, an example is, uh, you know, did you experience cold or cough in the past six months? So the option is yes or no. That's it. There are no more options. So, so the person has to either take yes or no. Okay. <clears throat> now I can ask the same thing as an open-ended question, you know, and there here the, the participant will start telling everything, all their stories and everything. Now, so I will only use an open-ended question strictly only why, where it is needed. Okay. Now if I have to take some data, uh, some, some data for which I don't know the question, then I can have an open-ended question. 
Okay. So we usually use, uh, you know, uh, close-ended questions. And we also, this is this is another important thing. We also use what is called as a filtering question. In, between, in, a, in a questionnaire, we use a filtering question. Now, for example, uh, the same, let me take the same word case, okay? If, if in, uh, some of you told me that, no, we should use only one questionnaire. So, okay, in that same questionnaire, what I can do is, I can ask, in, in the first five, five questions, they can be common questions. Then in the fifth question, I can say, uh, are you uh, are you an employee that is associated with the medical care of the patient? Yes or no? So if it is yes, then please answer the following questions. So then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, then all that will be answered by doctors and nurses. So in the fifth question, if it says, are you an employee who doesn't take care of the health care of the patient? If they say no, then you can say, go to question 11. So directly you can ask them to skip these questions and go to question 11. So from question 11 to question 12, it will be based on maintenance and cleanliness and infrastructure and services. So these are questions which the uh, cleaners, the ward boys, the helpers, these people can attend, right? So if you think that I don't want to have different set of questionnaires, okay, that will be cumbersome, then you can intelligently design in one single question itself, or for everybody but before what when you do that you need to have sections and you need to and you need to have filter questions so the filter questions will make only the people who are appropriate for that section of questions answer that if not they will go to their own section so a filter question is used to design uh, open uh, um, holistic questionnaires questionnaires for which we are having different types of respondent groups if you're having uh, different respondent groups, then we use filter question in between. Okay. But now there is one inherent risk. Do not use too many filter questions because people uh, can be very careless. Okay. Sometimes they will just, uh, they'll, for example, if you read 1B, okay, filtering. Okay. If there's a filter which says, if no, please go to question 14. Usually respondents won't read this and they will simply go on answering everything. So then your data, there will be error that will creep inside. So filter question has to be uh, pro appropriately put in and it should be properly highlighted so that they know that this is a filter question. Okay. So this is an example. Now, uh, I'll come to this. Now, these kind of questions, ambiguous questions, uh, we generally do not use these kind of questions. Okay. Uh, how often, not very often, sometimes, quite often. These kind of terms, okay, we do not very often use it. Please don't see the others. I'll come to the others later. I just wanted to show this. So ambiguous questions are to be avoid, uh, avoided, especially in uh, scientific research. We do not use these kind of questions, okay? And uh, these are called as double barrel questions. Double barrel questions is a question within a question. There is an inherent question. We do not use that kind also. Two questions attached in the same thing. They will get confused. The respondent will get confused. So we do not use these kind of questions. Now, as I told you, this, this is another uh, very important consideration. So the first important consideration before you start a questionnaire design is the intention of the questionnaire. The second one is the target group. Now, this is the third very important consideration. The outcome, the output, or how are you going to analyze the questionnaire? Okay, this we will not know fully. We will not know 100%. But nevertheless, you should have some idea in your mind. Okay, because that is going to influence the question. Now, for example, when I asked what are the aspects we will start considering, somebody said age. Right. Now, the age, I can take it in different ways. I can take it as exact date of birth. Now, we all know that we are all very averse to giving our exact date of birth. You know, we ourselves from our own personal experiences, when we go shopping, when we fill coupons, we will not give our exact date of birth because we're very, you know, we are apprehensive. So sometimes when we ask date of birth, people may not give the exact. So you have to be very clear why you're asking that. So instead of just asking the exact date of birth, you can just ask them age, okay? So age is a very good option. But 
Ah, yes. But there is a problem that when you ask age, okay, if it's a young uh, target group, all youngsters, there is a problem again. Uh, for example, the girls section, they will not want to respond. So in such cases, you need age, but you should know whether you need the exact age or is it okay if I can categorize it? So I can say 5 to 10 and then 10 to 15 or 10 to 18 teens and then 18 to 25 college going then 25 to 30 working young adults and then like that you can go on having uh, categories. Now this depends on what is your questionnaire. Okay, do I, do I need the age exactly for my outcome? If not needed then it's the best is to put it in category so that you will know that the respondent will give you the exact uh, uh, answer and they will not manipulate it. Because if you ask for the exact age and they give you manipulative data, then that becomes a bigger error. Okay. So sometimes like this, we should know. So if I want age, can I use the exact, uh, wh what is it in my, in my outcome? I'm going to say that uh, teenagers respond like this. So then I can say teenagers are people between 12 to 18, right? That's all. So I, I can put that category. Or if I want to say that uh, college students, I want to say uh, undergrad students, then I know that undergrad is usually between 18 to 23. So I can categorize it like that. So like this, if you know what your outcome is based on, or you should have some indication, then it will be easy for you to remove errors in the questions, okay? That is very important. Similarly, is uh, you have some sensitive questions like ethnicity. Okay, for example, uh, community, class, caste, race. These things are all uh, things that are associated with one's ethnicity, socio-cultural status. These are all very sensitive questions. So you should know whether do I really need this question. For example, uh, when when we have our rural studios. Uh, I, I very specifically am very uh, particular with this with my students because there are times when you can get into issues, troubles on field. So you must be very clear with this. Do I really need this data? What is this data going to do to my research? If I need it, okay, let me have it. If I don't need it, let me not have it. One is what will happen to the your, okay, that is one aspect. The other aspect is when the respondent is sensitized right at the beginning of a questionnaire, then their pattern of thinking, their mood of question, uh, you know, responding will change. So we should see to it that we don't have any sensitive questions that trigger a respondents, uh, you know, certain biases. So that is very, very important. And since we are all architect, uh, uh, architects and we are people who are involved with people uh, and uh, built environment is essentially used by people. So and you know uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly we will have to continuously keep gathering data about people from people but when you do that you have to be very very sensitive to the sensitivity of the respondent so that is why uh, we you know uh, we uh, we we say that you should have an idea as to why you are having this question what in what way will this question help your research is it exactly True. Is it exactly needed? If it is needed, in which best way can I frame it? In which best way can I format it? So this is very, very important. Okay. Any questions as of now? Any clarifications as of now? Uh, yes, ma'am. I had a question. Please. Uh, Ma'am, you were just talking about age and the apprehensions that people have disclosing their age. So I had a similar observation. People are usually also apprehensive about uh, sharing data uh, regarding their income. Right. So, so how do you deal that? Because at times you need to know the profile, you know, what category of income group you are dealing with. But most of the time I've seen that whenever the question is to do with income groups, and even if it's, you know, a, a range of income, you know, instead of uh, a direct question, you're just giving them a range. They, they still skip that question. So right. would you have any suggestion? Like, how do you frame a question revolving around income? Right. That's a very, very sensitive question and very rightly asked. Uh, so whenever we have household surveys like this, we never ask them income. Never, never ask them income. So we will ask them 
questions all indirect questions which will point to their economic status please remember it will only point to their economic status unless and until you need the income directly as a data okay if you just need to know the economic status then you can ask questions like do you own a house are you paying a uh, are you currently undertaking a housing loan do you own a car how many auto you know two wheelers do you own are you paying vehicle loan so like this we will uh, we will ask all questions that in which one makes an investment see income is is, is fine indirectly related to investment right your your expenditure your purchase so we will connect all questions related to this and gather their economic status that's all but uh, if you need income for any particular reasons then you have to uh, you know you have to first <laughs> get social with them and then see to it that they tell you their income that's the way but if not we use indirect questions which uh, which will uh, connect us or which will give us data regarding their purchasing uh, uh, abilities which will give us uh, data uh, regarding their expenditure uh, patterns so with these we can find out the economic status right okay ma'am thank you yeah yeah, 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 yeah. madam yes please if anybody wants to substantiate my answer also you can do it if it's if anybody oh. has some good idea madam i have a doubt madam please now let me say, uh, let me think that if i took a topic and there were a few other people worked on the same tire similar topic of mine then if i do an interview for the person uh, x person who already worked on it but my outputs might not be the similar way how he thought and if we take an interview of him in what category does this come madam it's like uh, if we need an any specific questionnaire for it or it just comes under a interview or what madam no uh, see usually uh, um, i don't know why you want to go interview that person because we only bother about the research so you can always interview the person but if you're doing the same topic if if your research questions are the same if your objective is the same your sampling group is the same then as you know subian sir said it is plagiarism it is not research no madam actually i am a research i am i'm not able I to understand your question uh, exactly let me say that now I, actually i am a research student madam my topic okay. is on uh, world indian ancient settlement pattern okay and, uh, how it is implement, implemented and how they are fighting with the disease spread and all there's actually okay. question there were some many so many references are there who worked on the indian uh, town planning patterns and all from ancient to present yes uh, yes i have a person who worked on kautilya and uh, how it is uh, implemented and present the indian context in uh, okay city planning and all now if i uh, now my context is completely different and the obviously person, you're looking at the architecture and planning context yes ma'am and that person would have done the historical context yes madam yes. now okay. if i want to interview him in uh, do we need a specific uh, questionnaire for them to get the information or does it simply comes under in just an interview ah now that is uh, okay i understand what you are saying now the, uh, see an interview is also a questionnaire but if you are not going to if that interview is only for your knowledge sake okay then it is you can just have it as an interview you can just go and talk to him and ask him but if any of his if you are going to ask him for questions which will be used in your research then you better ask it as a questionnaire see if you are just going to talk to this person to find out how he did and so that you will also get some clues then it's an interview it is got nothing to do with your research but then if you are going to ask like for example let me say uh, mohan jadaro had this planning okay now can this planning be applied for this particular reason you are going to uh, you know ask him and you are going to take his opinion into your research consideration then it has to be a question so you can talk with any number of people sir but if you are going if you are not going to use that talking for to be included in your research data 
then there is no need for a questionnaire if whatever they say gets into your data then it has to be structured or it has to be documented i understand what i'm saying i can simply go and talk with 10 people nobody can stop me i can talk with 10 people that doesn't mean that i have to keep documenting everything that I, every person i talk to but if if i'm talking to a particular person and what he says as a data i am including it in my uh, data analysis then it has to be documented that's the idea right okay right so shall we move on uh, ma'am i have a question uh, yes please not exactly about the questionnaire but about the analysis of the responses that we get so i was doing this uh, research about thermal comfort so my initial questions the initial five questions were all personal questions related to the age gender height weight and the kind of clothing that the respondent is wearing right now and the rest of the questions were uh, not personal questions so i wanted to correlate the responses of the later question with their personal data so uh, can you suggest any open source tool for correlation data that i'm getting out of the questionnaire because all the tools for correlation are paid ones yeah huh. see simple correlation uh, like uh, pearson's you can do it in excel itself uh, simple pearson's correlation simple spearman correlation uh if it is only very simple that you can do in uh, excel itself if not you can do it in anova anova is you can uh, you can get anova that's not a problem right you can use anova as a statistical tool and you can do relational uh, correlational analysis in anova very easily right okay oh, yes. thank you ma'am Okay, so let's very quickly move on. Uh, okay, so these are some of the types of questions. Uh, we'll not go very deep into this. I'll show you some examples, and uh, with that, we'll wind up the discussion. So, as we already told, open-ended questions. Now, the other kind of questions are dichotomous questions, where we only give them two choices. Okay, they are uh, bipolar choices, yes and no, like that. Okay. and then we have multiple choice questions multiple choice questions as we know uh, we give them different uh, options and then they need to choose from that and then we have what is called as scaling questions now scaling questions are we have a set of options and we have different ways of uh, giving this option okay i will show you examples of each so in the scaling questions there are four types of measurements and uh, the these four are the common and the most popular ones the nominal scale the ordinal scale the interval scale and the ratio scale okay so we will very quickly see examples of each category now this is a, a website that i have used primarily for taking uh, most of the screenshots i am showing you this so that uh, you uh, you know you can go and you can click on each one separately and you can uh, clear your doubts okay this is a very useful uh, website for uh, question framing so those of you who are interested you can take this question too so when we talk about uh, you know measurement scales see this one is uh, you know multiple choice there are lots of multiple choice so i'm just showing you this so that uh, you can go and you can check out yourself now let me go to the scaling because scaling is the one that is normally used in uh, architecture and social uh, science researches so the first type of scaling is what is called as a nominal scale now in a nominal scale we just have a a or a b question and see we have a total set and we just want to know how many are in this how many are in this that's all we just want to know that so that's a very simple question so a simple uh, uh, way of uh, categorizing our data set now the next one is we want to know a little more deep in the nominal scale okay so we just don't want within uh, within a or b we need to go a little more uh, you know uh, deeper now for example uh, let me say in the nominal scale i have an example okay uh, let's say milk bikis okay uh, do you buy milk bikis biscuit yes or no that's all so we get yes and no but 
in this yes i don't know why they are buying in this no i don't know why they are not buying so the nominal will not give me any clue about the answer itself which is why we go to the ordinal scale so the second question is so if you are buying milk bikis biscuits why do you buy it okay uh, the reasons for me buying is so i will have range of satisfaction i i uh, like i i am highly satisfied with the biscuit to i am not satisfied okay there will be a scale so the person can choose so now we will know within that category of how many are buying and in that how many buy, who are the people who are buying how many are satisfied with it how many are okay less satisfied with it and how many are not satisfied at all yet they are buying so you understand the difference between nominal and ordinal from nominal you can move to the ordinal scale now the interval scale is i in the ordinal scale i understood okay so so many people are satisfied and so many are okay not satisfied but i am not able to actually find out why they are satisfied itself so if i have to find out why they are satisfied or if i say there are 50 people who are satisfied are all the 50 people satisfied in the same way or are there different levels of you know satisfied so then i will go to the interval scale so what you can understand is these types of scales as you keep going the kind of quantitative data the type of quantitative data that you get are more and more in the interval scale so if you want to get more precise quantitative data then we use interval scale or if it's only for classification you know larger identification and classification of the data set then we use nominal scales and ordinal scales okay so these are the simple three types of the measurement scales that are normally used in research so this is an example for the nominal scale as i told you so you are having a data set of students and you just want to know how many are introvert how many are extrovert so you will just say are you introvert are you extrovert yes but they'll tick appropriately so let me say i have a class of 40 so if 20 uh, tick introvert and 20 tick extrovert i will know okay i have a class which is equally introvert and extrovert that's all that is all, all that the nominal scale will tell me but if i want to understand within that 20 introvert how many are you know very introvert how many are less introvert then i have to go for a different type of scale that is that is move on to the next ordinal scale so the examples for nominal scales are usually you know uh, 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 the dichotomous answers uh, like you know the gender male or female or selection colors like this so these are simple examples as you can understand now you know this is an ordinal scale right so as i told you now if 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 in the introvert itself i want to find out how introvert they are so i will say that very introvert okay very extrovert so within that i can find out okay so this is like you you want the data set and you want to group the data set into sub categories and you would like to rank them okay so then it can be used as an ordinal scale and usually in ordinal scales we use a scaling of 1 to 5 usually it is either 1 to 5 or 1 to 7 okay with the central point usually being the neutral value so the central point is usually kept as a neutral value and the positive and the negative move on the up and down of the scale now this is what is called as a very simple uh, ordinal scale one of the most common ordinal scales that is used uh, in in any kind of domain you know in uh, product survey in uh, marketing in advertising in customer feedback and all this is what is called as the likert scale the likert scale is a is a five point scale usually it's a five point scale it can also be a seven point scale in some rare cases where we know that there is a lot of uh, uh, what do you say the data set is uh, divided more divided if not we usually use the five point likert scale which moves between the positive and the negative range with a central uh, neutral range okay and usually in many of the socio economic surveys we use the likert scale like this so when we say uh, what is the advantage okay the advantage of an ordinal scale uh, it is easy for us to compare between variables so if i have okay let me say i have 50 students and in the 50 students i want to see the uh, feedback for my class so i will ask the 50 students please 
uh, choose the scale. So out of 50, if I'm getting, you know, 20 strongly agree and 30 strongly disagree, then I know, okay. So there is, uh, you know, the more of the students have not understood the class. Now, if I get the scale and I say that, okay, uh, 25 give strongly agree and 25 give strongly disagree, I know that the class is equally divided. Now, if 10 say uh, strongly agree and 40 say strongly disagree, I know that then uh, almost whole class has not understood. So it gives me to understand, okay? And if I'm able to get 10, 10, 10, 10 in each, out of the 50, if I get 10, 10, 10, 10 in each, then this puts me in a, in a very big problem. So I know now that the variation in the sample set is very high. So now I have to go to the, to a little more, more quantitative tool. I cannot solve it with this. So basically with, with the ordinal scale, you will be able to see whether the data set is more diverse or less diverse. And if it is more diverse, you need to go to a more quantitative scale. The, this scale cannot help you. If it is less diverse, then the scale can help you and you can go ahead. Are you all able to understand what I'm talking? Okay, so that is one of the uh, you know easy uh, reasons why the Likert scale is often used for questionnaires, for polling and all that. And also this is one scale which is easy for all kinds of respondents. You know, the respondent doesn't have to be very educated, very thing like that, because it is a linear rating scale. They can easily understand the scale. Now there is something now from this on, uh, if, if, if you know, I'm, if I said that I'm getting a very diverse data set and I need to get more quantitative in, in, in uh, my need, I need to get more quantitative data, then I should go for these kinds of scales, like the ratio scale. Okay, so in this ratio scale, I will start having categories. Okay, now for example, uh, in the previous example, when I said uh, the class of 50, okay, if the 50, uh, if I get an uh, uh, like a scale in which 40 say that they have not understood, okay, then what I will do is I will say, please select the lesson which you were not able to understand. So then I will start putting, okay, lesson one to two, lesson two to four. Lesson four to six, lesson six to eight, lesson eight to 10. Then they will very easily tell me, they will tell me, uh, okay, lesson eight to 10 was the one. If everybody picks up or more people pick up, then I will understand that as the advanced in the lessons, the students were not able to understand. So I am getting not only that they are not understanding, I am able to pinpoint exactly where they are not able to understand. So this kind of data will help me get more exact quantitative measurement and I will be able to fix the variable. So I'll be able to have a variable measurement scale. That is why we go in for these kinds of data. Now, for example, uh, if you look at this, you know, this is a simple example. What is your height? Okay. So if they will not know the exact height. So if they don't know the exact height, then what they can do is, okay, I am within this range. They will definitely know. Let me say that they have taken their height measurement two years back. They are not aware of it. Then they can say I'll be within this. Similarly, within this. Okay. So what the uh, the ratio scale or what these interval scales try and do is they bring you closer to the quantitative measurement. Okay. So these are all some of the most uh, most common interval scales that are used in our uh, research. So the Likert scale or the bipolar scale or the net promoter scale. Now, uh, when we say, uh, okay, let me show you the examples first. So as we already told you, the Likert scale, which goes on a pi scale range, then this is a, a net promoter scale. Now the net promoter scale, the NPS scale is uh, usually on a ranking of one to 10, okay? so. When you use a net promoter scale, you should know very clearly that there is so much of diversification in the data set. If you don't have a diversification, don't use the NPS scale. It will only give you wrong, wrong uh, reading. So you should know that there is so much of diversification. Then you can go in for the 1 to 10 scale. Or you should know that your respondent will be able to exactly pick up and say that they are within this range. If not, they will just happily play with, you know, two to four, four to five, and they'll pick up some 
happy number they like and they will just go off like that and um, this is a metric scale the metric scale is you know something that is used for uh, connecting between variables okay so if you uh, if you want to connect between variables okay uh, like for example you have uh, if you can see this example here what do you think of this dress so in this their opinion is also there but their opinion is between the range of itchy and super soft so you have given they, they can get they can give their opinion for each one between the end scales between the uh, super positive and the super negative so between this they will have a scaling so similarly dull and vibrant so you fix the corners and uh, you fix the characteristics and within the characteristics you can use the metrics so you create a matrix uh, with in one single question you will get uh, you will you will fix all the characteristics of this particular dress and you will fix the uh, you will get their opinion okay or you will get their ranking so this is like in in one question you have a subset of three questions so the characteristics are broken down and they are put it put in the scale format okay so this is a matrix table okay this is a bipolar matrix table because the matrix table is set between two bipolar characteristics so like this you can create matrix tables uh, between any uh, context either uh, you can have it bipolar or you can have but but you should know one thing that when you go for the when you use this kind of questions you should tell the respondent that this is the question you can answer between this and this and you should pick up any one of this so for these kind of questions the the respondent group should be a little aware educated or before you give the question you should uh, introduce okay you should tell them that this is how you will do the ranking or this is how you will do the uh, choosing of the answer so this requires a little bit of introduction to the group if not they will not understand that it's a matrix right oh, okay Ms. Supri, your mic is mic is on, please. Ms. Supri, your mic is on. I don't think she can hear. Right. Okay. So similarly, uh, sometimes we use what is called as the semantic scales. Now, the semantic scales are not very much used because instead of uh, uh, numbers, instead of uh, you know uh, standard terms, we will give certain uh, we will use some complex words to get their exact uh, feeling or response or emotion. So that is why it's called a semantic. where the words are used largely so usually only for post occupancy behavior or social uh, you know responsive behaviors like that we will use these kind of scales if not we don't use the semantic scale okay so this is uh, this is uh, the advantage of an inter uh, interval scale basically in an interval scale you get more uh, quantifiable data you get more characteristics of the data which you will not normally get in a nominal or an ordinal scale so in in a questionnaire when you have a single questionnaire you can have a nominal scale you can have an ordinal scale and you can also have an interval scale all the scales are also possible you can put them into sections so section a okay you want to just know about uh, their personal details section b you want to know about their certain other you know how they have used the product so what is their satisfaction rating in section c you want to know the details the the exact uh, characteristics of uh, how they are dealing with this then you can go for so in each of these section you can use three different scales so you can either design an entire questionnaire based on one scale or you can design a questionnaire with multiple scales in it everything is possible but only thing is you should present it in a clear manner so that the uh, respondent group is able to identify okay so i guess uh, that's it this is these are some important aspects that i wanted to talk to you about uh, questionnaire design 
because the questionnaire is a very important part of uh, any case study or data analysis, data collection stage, right? So are there any questions? Any clarifications, anybody? Okay. So shall we assume that there are no questions? Uh, just one thing, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yes. So what I understood, a questionnaire can be uh, a combination of any of the methods that you just explained. So it could be a combination of close-ended and open-ended questions. It could be a combination of you know the various scales you talked about. So am I going in the right track? Is is that what's you What's can, that? you can. But then when you have so much of uh, uh, variations, mm -hmm. you have to be very clear the sequence in which you are asking these questions. Okay. Like you cannot ask an open-ended question first and then you start going to close-ended mm -hmm. because the person's mind would have already started roaming freely in an open-ended okay. question. Then okay. you will get into trouble. So that is why in, the, in a good questionnaire design, the sequence of questions in what sequence you're going to ask is very mm. important. Okay, uh, why I was asking this was uh, because at times uh, the question is that we prepare is based on the literature studies that we have done, right? Some kind of literature review and that gives, an, gives us an idea about that particular uh, context and that particular research question, right? And uh, that's how we come up with the questionnaire. But then the options would be the ones that we study in the case studies or in the literature reviews and things like that. And there could be some new uh, perspective, which we may miss out if it is a, if it's a totally close-ended uh, questionnaire or, or with you know just five options and things like that, multiple uh, choice questionnaire. So if there is a possibility of adding an open-ended um, uh, you know, option, you know, like uh, for example, uh, a question has A, B, C, D, and then E is others and please specify. So I think okay. that kind of, uh, gives us, you know, the possibility of, of having alternatives, alternate responses. Yeah, there are uh, two answers, uh, two parts to the answer. The first one is, uh, I do not totally agree with uh, what you say as the questionnaire is, you know, biased by the literature uh, survey, by the literature review that we do. Uh, that is not the case usually. The literature review is, uh, is only to identify research gaps. A, a literature review is usually only to identify techniques and tools, uh, not especially for questionnaires. Questionnaires, as I already told you, should mu and must come from the intention of the research question. The intention of the hypothesis is what designs a, you know, uh, defines a questionnaire, and it should come from the target group. That is very important. So questionnaires usually are not taken from literature uh, survey. I, I'm sorry, I do not agree with that. And the second part is, yes, uh, you know, we, we always have this fear that we would have left something. We would have not covered something. So usually if you look at any questionnaire, there will be one to, you know, 10 questions or one to 15 questions. And at the end, there will be a small box. Any other remarks, any other comment, any other feedback. Okay, so they will give them a small open box in which they can write something. So that is always there. Uh, an open-ended questionnaire is always given, is generally, not always, is generally given as a final question to any questionnaire. So that if we have missed something or if something that we didn't ask comes out, then it can be a new clue. So that is possible, very much possible. You can always have an open-ended questionnaire as a, as a free uh, comment box at the end of a completely structured question. It will not do anything to your question, but this, but there is this uh, important hierarchy of uh, arranging the questions. If you put an open-ended question first, then you lose track of the person. So you first keep them focused and then you open them out. You cannot open out a child and then you know close it. It, it will not uh, uh, work that way. But you can always keep a child close and then you can open it out and it will freely go like that. So similar uh, you know, kind of thing can be done. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. All right. So any other questions? Okay, so uh, what we are doing is because uh, uh, our today's schedule got disrupted. So 
we will be having only one session today and the other session is a home exercise for all of you so based on today's session all right you are all required to design a feedback questionnaire for this five day ttp so you, you you are on a teacher training program okay this five day program and you are all required to design a feedback questionnaire for this program you know coa has a normal feedback pattern okay but let us keep that aside we will not go there let us see uh, from the research point of view how each one responds and this is a common uh, this is a very common uh, uh, intention or a common uh, objective because you are all here in it right away so which is why i thought i'll give you this uh, assignment okay so you will have to uh, so, you know mail these assignments to me you will have to mail it to me uh, by uh, by tomorrow to o'clock so that some of the good questionnaires we will take it and we will discuss it in tomorrow's second session 